now, Laura. Here this afternoon, and um, actually, I think my presentation feeds in really nicely with the previous one as well. There's a bit of overlap, I realize, as I was listening to it. Um, so bear with me if some of it is repeated. Um, before I delve into my presentation, I just wanted to take a minute to introduce myself and where I'm coming from in choosing this particular topic. Um, so my background is in <coughs> education administration. I just finished a master's in that uh, late last year. And previous to that, I worked as a classroom teacher in the elementary school system. Um, and currently, I'm working at Ryerson University as a project coordinator of something around the green economy. Um, and it's looking into social justice and environmental implications of this emerging green economy in the Toronto context. So two different areas, and I'm attempting to, to bring them together here today. Um, so hopefully the framing is done in a way that actually makes some sense. Right, so I found this quote and it really spoke to the challenges that I faced in trying to bring together this presentation in the first place. Um, just in that everything is interrelated and it's hard to kind of pin down what's the most important pieces to take from it. Uh, so the environment and education are arguably intertwined. You know, what's happening in the environment around us uh, is impacting what we learn. Um, and we can also form a, format our education um, so that we can learn specific things about the environment. Um, and both of these things are impacted at the same time by this bigger sort of gear of the culture within which we live, um, which at this time is uh, characterized by neoliberalism and a consumer culture. Um, but at the same time, education can be used as a tool uh, to influence the consumer culture itself. Uh, I had originally intended to speak to the corporatization of uh, classroom and education spaces, um, but it was just getting too big, so I had to kind of pare it down, so I won't get into that today. Uh, so, speaking to the goals of public, public education, so this was already alluded to in the previous presentation. Um, so, just a couple of the functions that public education holds. Uh, for one, teaching democratic citizenship. Um, so, teaching people how to be citizens in this democracy in which we live. Um, but also, socialization and the promotion of high culture and legitimizing certain forms of knowledge and experience over others. Um, and that second piece is not something that you're going to see in any Ministry of Education curriculum documents uh, for obvious reasons. And also um, because the Ministry of Education and the education system itself is situated within that cultural hegemony, um, which uh, places it as that um, promoter of high culture in and of itself. So it's not going to recognize itself as uh, fulfilling that role. In addition, the focus of the education hasn't always been the same. It's shifted over time in the Canadian context. Um, starting off in the Confederation era, um, it was mainly focused on the ideas of community building and nation building. Um, whereas over time and moving towards today in this era of global capitalism and neoliberalism, it's much more around uh, employability and um, making students who are competitive in the global marketplace. Um, and Mitchell and Ortiz speak to shockwaves of political, economic, and cultural change that have resulted in this economic function of education being seen as more important than its civic function. Uh, Hargreaves would argue that we may now actually be entering a new era in education where the pendulum is swinging from that extreme of neoliberalism and starting to recognize, you know, maybe we need to start focusing on the civic education a little bit more, um, but it's yet to be seen whether we're actually getting there yet. Uh, so neoliberalism, I actually, I have to admit, I didn't even know what this term was until a couple of years ago when I started my master's. It was thrown around in my department like crazy and I just nodded like, oh yes, neoliberalism, bad. <laughs> uh, but this is the definition that I work off of and that I'm using in my presentation. And that's that freedom has been interpreted as complete free choice in an open market without regulation. This has led to the present context which is dominated by excessive competition a rugged individualism, a narrow utilitarianism, and reductionist accountability. So commodity fetishism. Uh, so we arguably live in a very brand conscious time, and the irony is not lost on me that I've got the Ryerson logo throughout my presentation as well, <laughs> branding myself. Um, but we increasingly associate consumer products, including our education itself, which is increasingly seen as a commodity, um, with how it's branded. 
And I really like this definition of commodity fetishism, that it's the tendency of people to see the product of their labor in terms of relationships between things, rather than social relationships between people. In other words, people view the commodity only in terms of the characteristics of the final product, while the process through which it was created remains obscure and therefore unconsidered. This has cru crucial implications for our collective ability to see and address the ongoing processes of social and environmental destruction under capitalism. So within this culture of neoliberalism, society is seen as a marketplace, and there's this excessive focus on economic advancement. And today, producing items is about making profit. Within this, human value and the value of the rest of nature are subordinate to the values of a world market and treated like commodities. We now see an unprecedented growth of a consumer society. Uh, so environmental education has been happening. There is a recognition that there's uh, environmental issues that need to be addressed happening around us. Um, but some of the main critiques of the way that it's being approached are that it's really about awareness raising and information sharing, and uh, there's too much emphasis on individual behavior and attitude change, rather than looking at the bigger structure of society and the systemic problems that were situated within. Uh, so the problem is not that people don't know. People are aware that we have environmental issues, environmental problems. Um, but change requires educational processes based on praxis, uh, developing consciousness about it, and active engagement. It doesn't draw on the root of environmental problems the way that we're currently teaching environmental education. And this consumer culture of capitalism based on inequitable use and ownership of natural resources isn't really uh, properly addressed. Uh, so right now in Ontario, if you do a Google search for environmental education in Ontario, you'll find all sorts of great things happening. Um, so this is just a sample of some of the things I found in my search. I'm going to pick on eco schools because I'm familiar with them. Um, so eco schools is a program for elementary schools, I believe maybe secondary schools, but I'm not sure. Uh, and the way that it works is schools uh, fill out a checklist of items under these six different categories and they get points for how many things they're able to check off. And if they can get a minimum of 50 of 100 points, they're certified as a bronze eco school. And the more points they get, they can be upgraded to silver, gold, or even platinum. Um, so it's a good uh, program in theory. It does raise consciousness around environmental issues in schools. Um, the problem though is that it doesn't challenge the current paradigm in any way. It's basically reproduce, reproducing current practices through a green lens. Um, so saying, yes, uh, consumption is fine as long as you recycle at the end of the day. Uh, so what is the eco-mind and what is the utility of the eco-mind? Well, it's critical of unsustainable economic practices and strives for innovative new approaches, uh, including a move toward participative democracy. So not just saying, you know, I'm going to buy these products because this is what's available, but questioning the products that we're purchasing, where they're coming from, the processes behind how they were made, and who is impacted in the way that they're made and disposed of when we're done with them. And rather than trying to save the environment as this external thing that's out there, recognizing that we're actually part of the environment, and that all of our choices, consumer choices and, and beyond, uh, impact not, all, not only the environment and ourselves, but other people um, sharing this world with us. Uh, so an example of the EcoMind approach to environmental education uh, is to demonstrate you know, the difference between the old game solution and the game changing solution. So you could say, yeah, keep buying the way you're buying, keep spending the way you're spending, um, as long as you recycle, you're fine. But the game changing solution looks at things like, well, let's question why we're buying these things in the first place. Do we need these things? Do we need to be you know, constantly striving to make more money so we can buy more things? Or are there alternate ways that we can do things? Uh, now, the province of Ontario has taken some steps towards addressing this in its education curriculum. Um, one thing in particular that's come out was in 2009, this framework uh, for environmental education in Ontario schools. And the way that this framework is set up uh, is that environmental education is not a separate curriculum area, but it's to be integrated across all curriculum areas. So making the links to how, say, social sciences uh, link to environmental issues and actually pointing out the ways that we can become more aware of being more environmental uh, and conscious citizens. Uh, so to what extent does this work towards fostering an ego mind? Well, 
One thing that I found, I, I just did a quick search and found that things like consumerism and consumption were mentioned relatively infrequently in the 68 page document. This is the grade one to eight one. Uh, there was a bit more of a focus on responsible uh, consumerism in the high school document, um, but it was still not really um, a central focus. It was very much still focused on the current paradigm of the neoliberal marketplace and um, continuing to be able to have that purchasing power to buy more things, but just being responsible about how you dispose of them or you know that you don't use too much energy or too much water. But it wasn't really getting to the root of a lot of these environmental issues uh, that again stem back into environmental and social justice concerns as well. So how can we leverage the goals of public education? Well, one way is through learning that consumer choices impact others around the world, not just the environment and the importance of citizen action and the activities of profit-driven uh, corporations. So uh, teaching students, you know, how they can mobilize against, um, that they're not powerless against the system the way that it is now. Um, obviously, it's a tricky subject because the Ministry of Education wants to remain nonpartisan. They don't want to be seen as touting socialist values. But I, it's, it's difficult to say why is it okay that they should be able to tout uh, you know, very right-wing values. Why is one okay and the other is not? Um, and in terms of the socialization aspect, um, recognizing that there are alternatives to our current profit-driven economy and re refocusing on better versus more. So it's not just about um, being able to get the job that's gonna make you the most money so you can buy the most things, um, but thinking about, well, how can we um, be wiser about the way that we spend our money and with the sort of choices that we make um, that contribute to a more socially and environmentally just economy overall. Uh, so I just wanted to finish off with this quote that I found uh, quite illustrative. Uh, so once we see through a certain lens, it's hard to perceive things differently because the Oh, sorry, let me start again. Once we see through a certain lens, it's hard to perceive things differently, be they the most mundane matters or the most momentous. Yet, the hard fact of human existence is that if our mental frame is flawed, we'll fail no matter how hard and sincerely we struggle. And in a way, an eco-mind approach to environmental education can become a powerful tool through which to envision any <coughs> order.